Cursed by the old gods in Bethany, we are five immortals doomed to walk the earth until we complete our thousand and one tasks. After centuries of dicking around, we are finally ready to complete our destiny and die. We are, for now, the immortals. We're on episode nine. Yay! Woo! Nine's a good number. Celebrate. Yeah. I don't know much about numbers, but I know it's a good number. It's three squared. Yeah, that's why I like it's it. It's the second prime raised three to three. the first prime's power. Okay, whatever. This is when I'm the dying. show where Adam just cries silently. <laughs> why are we discussing numbers why every we single not time? Be discussing numbers? <laughs> yeah, we've been over this. In episode nine, we're going to be reviewing all the 218th um, movies, albums, food, classical recordings, children's books, and TV shows. Before we tell you what we're going to review this week, let's see who's here. My name is Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. Pedro's absent. Ooh, where'd Pedro go? <laughs> I don't know. Why is Pedro absent? You're sitting <laughs> right here. You're talking. I'm, I'm here. Hi, guys. I'm Pedro. Fantastic bit. We're keeping it in. <laughs> <laughs> so every week we review one of the thousand and one blanks you must consume before you die. And this week, let's see what we're going to review. The movie is On the Town. The album is Fragile by Yes. Uh, the food is Rata Potatoes. The classical recording are the 24 Caprices by Paganini. The children's book is The Biggest Bear by Lind Ward. And the TV show is going to be Zanowichi Monogatari. And something, we have a new segment this week. This is episode, Ooh. I know, fancy. It's episode 9, which means we have done 8 previous episodes of 6 reviews a piece, and it's a weekly podcast, and sometimes it's hard to consume everything. So, we want to have a segment where different ones of the Immortals can kind of come back and review things that they didn't have a chance to do earlier in the show. Pedro was recently in Chicago. I was. And was able to consume two of the previously reviewed foods. Oh, God. Why, why did you bring that up? That's the point of the segment. What is this? <laughs> what is this segment called? This segment is called "Old Business, New Hinges." Catchy, I like it. Thank you. Yes. So, Pedro, uh, you had two foods. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was from episode four, which was a uh, what's that yeah. food called again? Oh no! Don't, don't even don't even the say food, it. The, the Evil food? food. Oh, mustarda de fruta. Oh god. <laughs> so, Pedro, what did you think of mustarda de fruta? Oh, which... bad, bad, so bad. It was. Sp- Spicy, and ah, like the texture. All the fruit had the wrong textures. <laughs> it kept getting worse. Like you start eating, you're like, "Whoa, this is not what I expected." Whoa, this is really bad. Okay, it's getting better. No, no, it's getting worse. It does not. It just keeps getting. And the aftertaste is so bad. Like you're like, "Okay, I was finally able to get this down. Why is my mouth still dying inside?" <laughs> Did you have a and peach? And why is it getting worse? I had, I think it was a peach at a big dark thing in the center. I had a bit of, I had a cherry, awful. Yeah, I a had cherry, a cherry. pear. Pears are not supposed to taste like, have the consistency of gummy bears. Ooh, gross. But it kind of did. I had, what I thought was a peach, turned out to be an apricot. That was probably the worst one. And that was bad, I thought yeah. the peach, I thought, I think I had a peach, but. I don't know. You you seem to like it a lot, Adam. I thought it all tasted the same and bad and very, very bad. I may have eaten all the peaches. Oh, God. It was just <laughs> horrible. So, horrible. Andrew, how many hinges do you give this? Well, I, was, I thought about this a lot, and I have to give it 0.005 hinges. We That's... only go to two points after the decimal, Pedro. No, nope, because this is, my, <laughs> this is my reasoning. I can't give it a one because you pick five random people. They're all going to hate it. Yeah. I can't give it half of one. I can't give it a point five because you pick ten random people, they're all going to hate it. You pick a hundred random people, <laughs> they're probably all going to hate it. So you can't go point zero five. I think you definitely have to go to about a thousand people before you find that one guy who likes this. So uh, like no, zero, I liked uh, I liked the peach. You're you wrong. liked part of it. No, Your opinions are wrong. He gave it a two point one on the episode. <clears throat> well, wrong. Okay. <laughs> Pedro, so we're going to round it up to 0.01. Oh, no, that's bad. We only go two points <laughs> after the decimal. Anyhow, you also had the food we reviewed on episode 8, which was salami, which is a uh, kappa. Salami, it was kappa. Yes. Kappa. Yeah, kappa. Yeah. Kappa. kappa. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't piacentina. It was just kappa. 
it was what Eadley had that fit within our parameters. So, Peter, what do you gotcha. think of that? That was a lot better. Um, I like the not as fatty one because, personally, I like the meaty side rather than the fatty side. But it was it was actually really good, pretty solid. I like the kind of cured meats that are actually like a muscle, a slice of muscle, like hamon and kapa and uh, loin, may smoke loin sometimes. And yeah, this was actually really good. Definitely eat it again. Give it a four point five. Four point five, very four point five inches. Yes, that was that was good. It did not overcome the 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 bad fruit stuff. That was That's that true. was terrible. Probably that that, that, that actually lived on after I ate the meat. <laughs> it was like I, I was trying to give this. A, I was thinking about giving this the fruit a negative hinge because it brought <laughs> good things down. It made good things bad. It did. What I if, burned once and I cried. <laughs> what if you wrapped the kappa in a fruit? We stuffed a kappa into a fruit? No, no, no the other way around. Oh. Uh, it, it will just bring the kappa down. It won't make the fruit any better. Now, Pedro, this is interesting and not technically part of the review, but uh, we had lunch when you were here, and you ordered a platter that had that mustard fruit. Oh, no, no, no. The platter different. that we yeah. had was just, it was not mustarded fruit. It was, no, or fruity mustard. Anyway, it was regular mustard, like mustard seeds, ground mustard seed, but I think it had fruit in it, like, infused into the paste-making process. Whereas the fruit stuff was actual fruit, but infused with must flavor. Right. So, either mustard fruit or fruit mustard. I don't know which which is the right order, but the one where it's actually mustard seeds with fruit infused into it, not bad. Tastes like mustard. All right. Yes. So that's, that's, that's my... Oh, and I put uh, the second season of Jack Bauer... Uh, it's called Twenty Four. It's it's called Jack Bauer. I'm I'm still not I'm not not adjusting my my end trading for that at all. That's a five. But oh, boy. that doesn't change anything. You reviewed it last time, so yes. But yes. please update us on every I, subsequent season that you. I watch. will. I definitely <laughs> will. Okay, and now that we finished our old business new hinges, as you just heard, we like to give hinge ratings to everything we're doing, but also because of something we decided a couple episodes back. We have a Hinge Fact of the Week. Yeah! Sarah, what is our Hinge Fact of the Week? Okay, there's this place called America Stonehenge, and I feel like it's going to figure heavily in a couple of Hinge Facts uh, because it's hilarious, but it's basically this place in New Hampshire that's supposed to be like just like Stonehenge, but American. And I would like everybody to know that, you know, the Brits create like a national historic site all around their hinges, and we decided to put in a snowshoe, tra- snowshoe trail and an alpaca, alpaca farm. So that's some of the things you can find in the park surrounding America's Stonehenge. That's beautiful. Along with a bunch that's of cute. stones or something. But more on that in a future Henge fact. Because we got to spread this out for a thousand episodes. Yes. <laughs> I'm so. sure we can find a thousand and one Henge facts. Yes. I'm sure oh. we can. There are a lot of Henges out there. Cut there to are. episode 314. <laughs> and we're just begging for anyone to build a new Henge. <laughs> Somebody please. But now let's get into the actual business at hand. We are reviewing all the 218th items from all these published books, and the movie we're beginning with is a musical this time. It is On the Town. But it's, it's our ma- first musical, isn't it? It is our first yeah. musical. It is from, I believe, 1949. It was the first collaboration uh, between directors Gene Kelly and Stanley Donen, and this was adapted from a popular Broadway show, but they took a lot of liberty with it, made a lot of new songs. It stars Gene Kelly, Frank Sinatra, and other people <laughs> who are not as famous as those two. Vera Ellen and Ann Miller, thank you very much. I apologize. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's about three sailors who have 24 hour leave in New York, and they make the time of this so they can see the sights. That lasts about three hours. Now they want to spend the other 21 hours <laughs> trying to get laid. Yep, that's definitely the plot of the movie. Like, that's the whole thing. Yep. yep. So, what. I assume that none of you guys have seen this movie before? I had not, no. I don't know. I didn't think so up until a point, and then I was like, wait. <laughs> so maybe. But I knew probably that, not. I, th- I knew the song, New York, New York, because it's been in a couple of like reviews that I've seen of you know like musical medleys and things like that, but not the whole show. Not the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York. No, right. Different, this, different this song. song that is not, not as good. Yeah. 
Not as good, it's true. So let's start with Adam. Adam, what did you think of On the Town? Uh, it was it was weird. <laughs> I felt like they terrorized the town more so than they <laughs> enjoyed New York, you know? Because they uh, they do a lot of illegal stuff. It's true. They start out uh, going to a museum and they knock down this huge brontosaurus. Okay, they did it on accident, though. Is that really illegal or just more like, whoopsie-daisy? If you are singing and dancing in a natural history museum, that's not an accident. Lawyer alert. No, but the guy guy pulled out, like, the kneecap or something. What kind of architect or whoever assembles dinosaurs leaves a loose kneecap that could just tremble... Crumble everything to the ground if you pull it out. It's his Achilles kneecap? Yeah, I suppose. It's not a thing. Well, I guess it is in this movie. Yeah. (laughs) That was my main issue, is that the dinosaur was not factual. factual, Right, (laughs) Right, because everything else is so realistic in this movie. Right, right. Well, yeah. Um, But it was, yeah, it it was fine. Not a great musical. I didn't like a lot of the songs. Um... And, yeah, it was just about these guys who... <laughs> so their portrayal of sailors was interesting <laughs> because I don't know if any of the three of them have ever talked to a sailor. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, uh, they were... It was just very... Uh, what am I looking for? Sugar-coated. <laughs> well, it is a musical of this era. This is yeah. an MGM yeah. musical, and it has... Very, very idealistic looks. At, at This is the cleanest New York's ever been in a movie ever. True. And oh, yeah. they actually did film a lot in New York, but loved them what it sounds I saw that. Mm-hmm. I, I always thought it was weird, like, what shots they chose to use on a soundstage and what were real and what was green screen. Like, there was a green screen moment. Which one was that? Oh, the, it's at the beginning when they're like the the, the girl dancing. No, oh, no, no, no. Is it when they're looking? There's the time when they're looking down the skyscraper when it's definitely just a like. A oh no, not background. that part. It's like at the beginning, like they just they're like walking down the street, or they just get off the subway and they're walking on the sidewalk, and like everything behind them is very clearly a soundstage with a green screen behind it. Hmm. Like you can see the yellow lines around them, so I guess <laughs> yellow screen. But yeah, it was poorly done. Still 1949. But, but <laughs> they, like, they were in New York. I feel like they could have rented a block for like 30 minutes to get that shot. Maybe they could have. I, I, think, they, I think they did. They had some on, on-site shots. Mm-hmm. They yeah. only had a couple of days of shooting in New York. Is what okay. it was yeah, like. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of it was with that soundstage. And that's more ideal because so many of the dance numbers in this movie are all one shot. Yeah. yeah. Those Man. were amazing. Oh my gosh. I just want to say. I when when they started the the yellow dance scene with the girl, I was kind of I was a little bit uncomfortable, hmm. but at the same time I really I was like, "You go girl, you are nailing this." Oh, where she's doing all this like like all the stuff. stuff? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, this is the, the final the final fight scene thing. That was was, cool. was really cool too. That was Vera Ellen. Vera Ellen was Miss Turnstile. And yes. she's amazing. She's, she's in one amazing. of my all-time okay. favorite movies, White Christmas. So I mean, yeah, it was it was a bit it was a bit weird. Maybe uncomfortable is a strong word. Just seeing the whole portrayal of women back then. She's a house girl, but uh, yeah, um, all that. I don't know. I so I will say, look, this movie is so much a part like of its time. And oh it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's delightful. But I will say, the character of Hildy just love yeah. her, and I was really surprised by her. So you know, like to give sort of some background, if you haven't seen the movie, there's three guys and there's three girls and to be frank the guys to me are pretty interchangeable but the girls are all quite different yeah um and so they've got vera ellen who's the sort of like you know the the beauty who's on the subway train and then you've got this other girl whose name i don't remember the one in green yeah who's she was my favorite kind of crazy amazing but she was my favorite but hildy Hildy is no 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 hildy is the cab driver Okay. She's wonderful. Who and is totally what I cool. what I found surprising about her because honestly, portraying a woman like the way that they do now mm-hmm. would actually be like, like a little bit uh, subversive. Is like she gets a guy into her cab and she mm-hmm. says, "Let's go back to my apartment," was, basically, yeah. and have sex. Like that. And also, like very clear. Real quick, I did not believe Frank, Frank Sinatra being, like, the nerdy guy who wants to go to the museum. It was I'm pretty funny. Saying. Although that's... So my favorite song in the whole show, for sure, 
because I was, I so I'm horrible, right? So I was Googling stuff as it came up. There's a song, I think it's called Hippodrome. Uh, which oh, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, del- it's, a, it's oh, basically, yeah. the, the plot is the Frank Sinatra character has a guidebook that his grandfather gave him <laughs> that has all of these sites in it that are from, like, the 19-teens, and they don't exist anymore, and he's wanting to see them, and Hildy's being like, what are you talking about? And <laughs> it's one of those scenes that, like, it, the song is borderline incomprehensible now because none of the we don't know about any of these things. But when you actually look it up, it's all so much fun because it all is these these references. But like Hildy is straight up sexually promiscuous. Like she yeah. straight up wants to have sex. I had to I had to just, look up when this movie came out after yeah. a few scenes with her. I'm like, is this more modern than I? Th- nope, yeah. nope, 1949. Okay. But like, yeah, I mean, and honestly, like that's I mean. It, it's the movie does not treat that as a bad thing at all. It, there's no mm-hmm. judgment on her character. There's no like scandalized people. It's she's great. That's just what you do with sailors, right? Yeah. Which I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that also goes to the character of Claire, the, and she pairs up with the guy who is not the anthropologist. Sorry, anthropologist, and she says I she love got her to anthropology so she can study men more. Yep. Because she got distracted by modern men, so she better get stuck at older men. <laughs> but she's attracted to Ozzy because he looks like a caveman. So, <laughs> well, like a specific caveman statue. Yeah, it's at the museum. It's delightful. And Ivy Smith, who is Miss Turnstile, Gene Kelly discovers her when they're on the train. And she is this month's Miss Turnstile, which is some sort of like New York like beauty queen of the month kind of thing. Does is that actually know? a thing? I don't, no, I don't, I don't think so. Probably not. But it's kind of a charming thing because although she's a very beautiful woman, the reason why Gene Kelly was attracted to her more than anyone else, because he does imply that in the film that, you know, he goes on many shore leaves and he finds many women, but he's attracted to her because she seems to be the most fascinating woman. So the, the number you guys talked about a moment ago, where it's just kind of this whole, almost dream seat within his mind of all the things that she does in this paragraph that's on the poster, where she gets to, sure, she might like to, you know, iron clothes and whatnot, but she's more interested in the high society life also, she's an athlete. Also, she's a genius. And she does all these things in one giant, awesome number where she has to dance and do all these things at the same time. So it's fascinating how they all are interested in each other. Gene yes. Kelly has, I guess, the most purest of their romance because he wants to, you know, he thinks he's falling in love in their day. Whereas the other four... Have sex! Yeah, th- there's yep. this, the death of subtext in this movie. But, like, I mean, and again, like, honestly... There's an element to which we become more prudish as a society. If this movie were made today, like, basically, I mean, people still go on shore leave. It's a real thing. Like, this would three, not be, like, a family movie type movie. No, movies. it would not be. Like, three sailors stop off in New York, meet three random girls, yeah. and sleep with them, and mm-hmm. take them out dancing, and, like... One like, of them's a burlesque dancer. One of them's a burlesque dancer. They oh. all commit mayhem. I mean, like, this is not a family movie now. But it is. It is like a, a. It is a movie that ascribes fundamentally pure youthful intentions to mm-hmm. its its uh, its participants. No, like the one scene where what they're making fun of Frank Sinatra and they're like, okay, so how's the date gonna go? Ten thirty, you hold her hand. Ten forty five, oh, you yeah, take yeah. her to a movie. Ten yeah. what? Eleven, your first kiss. What's at eleven thirty? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, and they make it they make it a delightfully rude gesture that yeah. I that is yeah. That's why I think this would actually make a really fun remake. I'm not yeah. a proponent of remakes necessarily, but it would it would be an interesting twist on this kind of situation in the society that we. I have feel now. like if you remade it, everybody would be like, "Oh, you know, they really made that nice Hollywood musical so dirty." Yeah. And we'd have to like, <laughs> no, for real. You would have to say what the musicals about. Yeah, go back and watch the actual musical. Yeah, like with the today's. Well, lines. I commented during the movie that I believe you said her name is Ann Smith, who plays. Claire the anthropologist. And Miller. And Miller. She looks so much like Vanessa Bayer from SNL right now. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's about it. So she can play her. <laughs> sure, sounds good. If she's going to cast on identical looking faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and mean, not dancing or singing skills. You know, whatever. It's not perfect system. So Gene Kelly and Stanley Dunham as directors, their next collaboration together was this movie called Singing in the Rain. And if it uh, is! Yeah. So Gene, this was their first film either one ever directed. They both come from stage. They both come from especially dancing musical stage. And the all the musical numbers, I don't think most songs are that memorable. 
but the dance scenes are very memorable. You yeah. Get, you get a very kind of, not conventional, but you get a very practical look at the dancing where you get to see head to toe in the entire frame. Mm-hmm. That's something that Frank, um, Fred Astaire always really pushed because he said, I don't want the, the camera to dance, I want to dance. You want to see me the entire time. And Jim yeah. Kelly was always someone who really kind of followed that through all of his movies. And one weird thing that's in all of Jim Kelly's movies, from this to Sing in the Rain to American in Paris, is the really long abstract dance sequence number. Okay, yeah, I wanted to talk about this. Is he just really narcissistic? Is the guy who produced, directed, and started his own movie where he gets his own dance number? Every well, movie. it's not just a dance number. It is a very long and extensive dance number. It this was. is one of his shorter ones compared to those films. <laughs> but it does... I thought this definitely could have done without that because it just summarizes... Yeah, what it just, just redid just the whole movie. Yeah. It was like a ballet version of, of everything up until now. Right. I liked it, but <laughs> it could have been shorter because I thought it was him, you know, just sort of daydreaming or nightdreaming or whatever, sort of, woe was me, I lost my gal. Yeah. Um... Let me dream about her for, you know, three, two minutes, maybe, at yes. most. Dance yes. a little bit, and then back to the movie. Yeah, these it was always, too long. These are always the sequences that kind of bother me about Gene Kelly movies. And this one, like, the real point of them is that Gene Kelly is an incredible dancer. And so during yes. this whole summation mm-hmm. scene, summizing scene, he's the only actor, Summation. aside from the woman who plays Ivy Smith, very yeah, I was wondering why they did that. I think it's because... They're not like, good actors. I mean, Sinatra they're not, good, they're not, not as dancer? good dancers. Yeah. I mean, but, like, oh, that was the thing that confused me. Like, Frank Sinatra and the guy who played Ozzy probably aren't good dancers. I get it. Ann Miller is a fantastic dancer. Yeah, it's like, I know. dance on their own yeah. for, like, these shots. The, the blonde girl and the tap-dancing anthropologist definitely can dance because they yeah. have their own full-on dancing sequences. Why not bring them? Well, I guess because then you'd have to say, why did you leave out Hildy? But I think I they could have Hildy. fudged it. I don't know. It, it was weird. It was a weird casting choice. Recasting choice. It really threw me off. This one, this scene's worked better for me than other Gene Kelly movies. Because even though it was just absolutely summarizing the plot, it kind of was their big romance number. Whereas the other couples do have a scene where they definitely mm-hmm. are now absent for a scene. Because they definitely, because they had, definitely, had, sex. They definitely had sex. This is the only time when these two essentially metaphorically have sex during the movie, hmm. and it's what Gene Kelly like wants the most, which is kind of a dancing partner. And hmm. musicals, typically, the way you can tell that a couple should be together is usually how well they sing together, when they kind of are in the same rhythm and harmony about what's going on. And Gene Kelly likes to show two dancers and just kind of show... Oh, these two should be together because of how in sync they are in this. So this mm-hmm. was seem to be a scene where like, you can kind of let them be impressive together for another longer sequence with even more elaborate choreography. And it, it was fun, but once again, it is like the Gene Kelly scene that's just going to go on for way too long, probably. But typically, the movie had such a really fun energy. It's such a fast-paced movie. The songs are delightful and silly. Mm-hmm. Um, it kept up this childish image uh, of the whole tone. Yeah. What else do you guys think? This is, uh, you know, this is a strange one. I, I really loved it. I, I feel like I kept waiting for it to make a turn that musicals, even t- made 10 years later, will do. Of, oh, wait, but this musical is really about uh, race or class or, you know, women and men. And it it's not. It's really about... Three guys meeting nice girls and having a great time, and it's like a silly romp in a way that so few films are now. I mean, it, it and maybe that's good. I mean, maybe it's better for movies to be about something. This movie is arguably not about much in in a mm-hmm. in a larger sense, um, but it's uh, it was kind of refreshing. Especially since yeah. the major spectacle pieces and the major things you were supposed to go like, wow, weren't like deep points. They were dance numbers. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the times that you were supposed to be really like, draw, you were supposed to drop your jaw at this movie was were these big dance numbers. And you just, you just don't see that. Um, mm. Or, well, that's not true. We do have Step Up. Let's be clear. Oh yeah, step up films are great. It's no, it, like, even that's about something else. But it is like, but like that's the thing. Which is like, why this is better? 
<laughs> right. Agreed. Agreed. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I enjoyed it. I usually do not enjoy musicals of this era. I find them kind of samey, like all the same, but this one I really liked. Mm. And see, too. I kind of have to disagree because I do enjoy musicals of this era, and I, I, just, I don't know. It just it fell a little flat to me. I, I I don't I don't I haven't seen too many musicals of this era, but from the get go, from the moment they start singing "New York, New York," I was just like, "This is awesome! This is great!" Real quick, shout out to the dock worker. He's my favorite character. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> this, He's amazing. This I love him. He gets he the films. Yeah. Might have had the best voice. Yeah, definitely. That was awesome. awesome. That Frank but, Sinatra guy has a pretty good voice, too. Eh. Well, pretty good, but yeah. I think the dock worker, the no-name dock worker is better, but, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Definitely. But really loved all the songs, all the pieces, dance numbers, the story, everything. Good movie. Everyone should watch it. A word for hinges? Here we are. I think so. All right, I'll start with this one. I will give this four hinges. It's a delight. It goes by really quickly. It's just a really great example of a lot of talents who this is their first film and now they're going to go off to even more impressive things. Very charming film. Four inches. You stole mine. So I'm going to give it a 4.1. Ooh. You yeah. got me. <laughs> Not a 4.00005? Apparently I can't. <laughs> and the other one was only two zeros. What so 4.1. 4.1, all Inches. right. Well, I'm going to give it a 4.2. And yes, that number was already in my head before we started this. Oh, um, for real, uh, I I loved this movie. Um, I can't quite... 4.5 feels like a different range to me of, like, important. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'll give it 4.2. Adam, there's a there's an obvious number here for you. Uh-huh. Uh, Be true to yourself. I am true to myself, and I'm going to give it a 3. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because it's... I just... It was fine. If you're looking for, like, entertainment, pure and simple, yes. Absolutely. Um, but I just don't think it's... Gene Kelly great. directed uh, a great documentary called That's Entertainment Part 2, which has showed lots of clips of MGM musicals. There you go. That's and entertainment. Phrase, that's entertainment over and over again for three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a great movie. You should watch it. Lee, how about you? I'm going to give it a 3.5. It's It's fun. It's fine. They're good musical numbers, but I think the, that he really underutilized Ann Miller, and I think Gene Kelly is really narcissistic. Uh, I cannot wait for us to review An American in Paris. <laughs> Should be mm. great. It's going to be awesome. Yep. So this film, at the moment of this recording, is currently on Netflix. If you guys yeah. have seen On the Town, I think even with a little bit of a mixed response from us, it is something worth seeing, and it's very uh, fun, at least, for different ranges. But now let's move on to something a little bit mo- more... Abstract. Abstract. Mm-hmm. Curious. We have an album called Fragile. Lee, what was this about? Okay, Fragile by Yes. It's a definitive prog rock. So for those of our audience members who are not familiar with prog rock, progressive rock, it's the long, drawn-out, heavy instrumental music that you hear in, like with guitars and bass and keyboards and, like, the famous 20-minute drum solos and things like that. And they often talk about sci-fi and wizards and Rivendell and other things like that. So that's prog rock in a nutshell. And I feel like this album is a great example of it. So this was my first uh, foray into prog rock. In fact, I didn't even know it was prog rock until 30 seconds ago. (laughs) I mentioned it in the podcast last week. I don't listen to the podcast. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me. But so this was this was uh, a curious. What did you think of this one? Was, you said it's a, a great example of it. But yes. Is that a good thing? Um. Okay. So I am a huge fan of Rush. So like I I am no stranger to prog rock. I I have I have seen Neil Peart perform twenty minute long drum solos in person. Like oh. this man is amazing. <laughs> I'm jealous. Three times. It was amazing. Every that's single time. Awesome. He's a great drummer. That's He's a wonderful drummer. Of a Highly recommend it. <laughs> anyway, that's Rush. We're talking about Yes. Um, another <laughs> 1970s prog rock band. It's, I don't... Okay, so I was discussing this with my roommate because I, I had to try to find some way to describe this album. Now, it sounds really stereotypical of prog rock. At the time, I'm sure it was, like, revolutionary. 
But because this is really my first experience with the whole album, it was difficult for me to get that, like, cliche mindset. Like, get rid of that cliche mindset. It was it was difficult. I was never been experienced to this kind of music before. In fact, I kept being surprised of, oh, there is, once again, no lyrics in this song. Yeah. Or, oh, this song is over very quickly. Or, this song is still not over. Yeah. <laughs> I still have yeah. eight more minutes of this song. So, it, I actually, I did enjoy it. I, I, I found it to be very catchy. It's weird to say, say catchy, I guess, no, but they, lyrics. They repeated a couple motifs throughout the album, which I think definitely helps. Like, uh, crap. Uh, Roundabout, which is the one that from this album that everybody will recognize, mm-hmm. if you recognize any of them. Um, and then... What was the other way? Long Distance Runaround uses a similar motif. I think that's the one I was thinking about. So, like, yeah, they kind of repeat riffs throughout the album to bring it all together. And they use other influences. Like yeah. The, the second song... The Bronze. The Bronze, yeah. Mm-hmm. It used that in an interesting way. And then Lee, you mentioned to us off-air that one of them sounds a lot like the Allman Brothers' Jessica. Which, I looked that up in trying to see if there is any correlation between the two, and it just sounds similar. Like, this album came out before Jessica did, so they may have been influenced, but since they were different genres, I highly doubt it. Mm -hmm. It did just feel like Top Gear was starting. It really did, like, for, (laughs) for, like, nine and a half minutes. Yeah. Now, Adam, you also listened to this. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on it either way. Um, it's fun. I liked Roundabout. Um, I didn't know it was Yes, but it was. Yeah. Surprise. Um, but yeah, it felt it felt jazzy to me, which I guess is the kind of prog rock. It felt like improvisational and um, yeah, it was, it was fine. It was really, I liked every single track on the album, but it was a bit fleeting, kind of what you're mm-hmm. saying now. The ones that stuck with me more, which is my taste were the ones actually with lyrics i go oh you actually you know they're not the most profound lyrics ever but this is good mm-hmm. yeah you're just singing all your songs yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think the singer is good um but yeah like with the second song the bronze one i was just like this that felt long to me even that though it was like two minutes <laughs> yeah but yeah it's just maybe prog rock is just not for me and it's not for some people <laughs> and that's totally fine i get it I, d- I, really I feel like Lee is judging us, though. No, but no, like, this album is definitely okay. I feel like there are better examples of prog rock out there that give you better instrumentality and better arrangements and better lyrics because you don't have to be completely instrumental to have a prog rock album. And I, I feel like that's kind of, at least with the prog rock that I do enjoy, that's kind of something that this album is lacking is better lyrics or more lyrics. I keep using the very unofficial method of rating an album where do I leave it on my phone or not? And this is the first one of the podcast. I'm going to leave half of it on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I like certain songs. Um, I really don't mind the whole album, but I'll be more confused. If something comes up in shuffle. If it wasn't one of the songs I like the most. So Lee, do you think it was on this list because, because of what you said earlier that it was like novel for the time but it's not so much now? Um, I think that's probably definitely part of it. I've noticed one thing about this list is it's very heavily British skewed when it comes to music. So, I like, this Yes is a British band, so that kind of makes more sense as to why they might be featured as compared to other prog rock groups at the time. But, I don't know, it's... In fact, I believe there's at least one more Yes album on this list. Yeah, and... Like, yes, had some popularity in the night in the United States, but they were nowhere near as successful as someone else. So, like, like Rush, I'm sorry, Rush is just like one of my favorite bands. So, <laughs> I don't think I know any Rush songs. You do. Is Tom Sawyer them? Yes. Okay, I know one Rush song. <laughs> you'll you'll you would recognize more. They're fairly successful. I look forward to that episode of the podcast. Yes, I will geek out wholeheartedly. <laughs> as if it was a Russian instrumental bullshit. <laughs> Industrial bullshit. I think we're ready for hinges. Lee, what do you think of this? Uh, three. Like, if I had a bunch of my nerdy prog rock friends over and we we're going to play some D&D for the night, I'd probably mm-hmm. throw it on, but... 
That's about it. That is very specific. I was also going to go three. Oh, yeah. Real quick, though. Rick Wakefield is the keyboardist, or Wake Wakeman. Rick Wakeman is the keyboardist for this band, for this album. This is his first album that he's on. Look at his Wikipedia page and tell me he isn't somebody who's never played a game of D&D in his entire life. I mean, he's wearing a cape in his Wikipedia picture. It's the way to be. Like, well, it's impressive cape. When you pose for Wikipedia, you dress to the nines. Yeah. yeah that's a rule. So anyway. I, I go with three hinges. Adam's on his phone looking at Wikipedia. Uh, Rick Wakeman. Yes, Rick Wakeman. I meant Wakeman. You know what yeah, I meant. Yeah, definitely. He's uh, he's in a cape playing oh, two yeah. keyboards at the same time. And there's two oh, more behind yeah. him. That yeah. guy, that guy, that guy. He and I could be friends. I mean, the the keyboard. Oh, in I'm this... looking at a picture of him right now. He's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, that's the, awesome. The keyboards in this album are in, intense. Um. Oh yeah, I was gonna give it a three too. Is that okay? Yeah, it's all up. They make me doing the math for the averages really easy. Great. It's, it's going to be a three. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, the keyboard is, is really good. The music, like the instrumentation, I thought was really good. But yeah, yeah just kind of, I'll probably forget about this it's, in two weeks. Yeah, I, I listened to it today and I, I had trouble thinking of differences. Or <laughs> right, Boston. right. Yeah. I mean, Roundabout is a great song. I actually really enjoyed the first one too, which yeah. was the long distance, which we'll call it. The first song is Roundabout, isn't it? But yeah, first one's Roundabout. The other one is Long Distance Run Around. Those are the two I liked a lot. Mm-hmm. I would say those are the best songs on the album, yeah. All right, so now I think it's time to go towards the food, which is yeah. been sitting on the table the entire... As, as is usually the case. So the, the food today is rat potato, R-A-T-T-E, which in French would be rat, and I don't know if it's rata somewhere else. Rat. Hot. 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 Yeah, hot. Um, so anyway, uh, so it's kind of, I'm going to ask this review a little bit, which is that it's relatively difficult to get American grocery stores to tell you what varietal of <laughs> potato you're eating. So <laughs> it's, and I know that's ridiculous, but rot is a, is a kind of varietal of fingerling potatoes. Um, and there are many kinds of fingerling potatoes, you know, some of which are local, some of which are not local. I mean, it's all over the place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we have fingerling potatoes. Uh, they look like rotch potatoes to me. Uh, they taste like what rotch potatoes are described as tasting like. And so they may very well be rotch potatoes. If not, they are very closely related to rotch potatoes, and I feel that we can review them reasonably. Um, but they are labeled at the store as fingerling potatoes. Rotch potatoes are a French varietal of, of fingerling potatoes, basically. So uh, if you care deeply, I mean, I guess I'll find out when I either die or don't die, whether I have to go back and redo all the asterisk reviews, but this will be one of them. I'm pretty sure that before the end, uh, I have to eat, like, cheese with maggots in it, though, so, you know, <laughs> things are things are going to happen to I'm, me. I'm excited for change that. my life before I have to go back. I would totally try it. Um, but, yeah, so, anyway, I, I just baked them with some olive oil and salt and pepper. Uh, I didn't want to overcook, uh, which makes me worried that the bigger ones are undercooked, so I would say go for the small ones. Small oh, ones. Want a good t- I mean, I think the big ones are good, too, but, you know. So, just, just go for it. A question I'm going to have, which is my, my food ignorance, is... When we bought these, they were all different colors. Does that mean anything? Well, so that's the thing. Fingerling potatoes have so many different varietals that I picked out the ones that uh, are the correct color, shape, and size to be rat potatoes. That doesn't mean I know that they are rat potatoes, <laughs> but I could tell you the purple ones are not rat potatoes. There's some other kind of fingerling potato. So, And these are none of the purple. Also, none of the purple now. Yeah, so they're all basically... It looks like fingerling potatoes if you've had them. I mean, I don't know. I see them on menus fairly frequently. Um, but yeah, um, I really like them. They have a lot more flavor than your average potato. More than I was expecting. Yeah, they are, they've got some... So, in French, uh, potato is pomme de terre, which is basically... Yep. Apple of dirt. Dirt apple. That's what they're called. Yeah. They're called dirt apples. <laughs> Fruit of the earth? My dirt apple. Nope. They're, they're called dirt apples. Pine or, cones are called pineapples. Yeah, that's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. They're made out of apples as like a generic fruit. Like, what are pineapples called? Well, not not pine like not pineapples in one word. Apples uh, with pine, with pine. Like, like spiced <laughs> apples. This is ridiculous basically. language. I don't like it, it is ridiculous language. Pineapple is anana. Yep, anana without the b, b banana without. Yeah. <laughs> um, these so these oh, are weird S in it. These are really good. They are really good. Um, yeah, they've got a uh, 
they've got they've got a flavor to them. Like the reason I mentioned the apple thing, what the hell is happening? <laughs> We're eating potato chips because you guys are never dying of fire. <laughs> We live in central Indiana. It's hard to find culture here. You well, could have opened the potato chips before we started. Or away you, from the microphone. You could have, yeah. Instead, I think you leaned in in order to get maximum <laughs> crinkle. Purpose. Anyway, um, yeah, but like, the reason I mentioned pulled potatoes is because, like, these kinds of potatoes actually make you kind of get it. Like, you can see it being like, you know what I'm going to eat today? A potato. Just potato. You know, like... Uh, and honestly, there's like basically no spice on these. There's just a little bit of salt and uh, some olive oil. And um, it's not as heavy as typical potatoes. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. three smaller ones, or it's just this kind. Yeah, it feels like something I could snack on rather than yeah. like a like a potato chip. Full on side, like not like that. that. <laughs> Shut up, Link. Um, no, actually, so the place that I really love to use any kind of fingerling potato is in salads, which is how the French eat them. So you slice them, you cook mm. them, and you slice them really thin, and they go in salads, um, usually with like a, you know, greens and like an, and like an egg, and uh, they're really delicious. Mm. Uh, so yeah, they're um, they a lot of the descriptions describe them as nutty, and I kind of get that. They're like nutty and sweet. Uh, they are definitely more of a snacking. They're I feel like like Idaho baked potatoes are really just starch delivery. Like all they really yeah. are is just like here is your starch compliment for the day. Yeah. Like, eat it and be happy. And these are very different than that. These are a whole different different food. Other other thoughts? Boys who are eating potatoes? I just... It's just listening to Pedro eat. How do you know it was me? Salt of yeah. your mouth is full when you're talking. <laughs> you guys um, are eating into the mic for food that's not the segment. <laughs> we're not eating into the mic. We just have to be near bad. the mic when we're eating potato chips. Yeah. The world's noisiest food. Mm-hmm. Worst podcasters. <laughs> um, yeah, these are these are lovely little potatoes. They're they have they're very sweet. They're yeah, there's tasty. a little bit of little bit of juice to yeah. them when you when you bite in. Um, what accent was that? Juice. Juice. <laughs> I don't know. Was talking out of his uh, mouth as small as I could possibly make. Sure. Did it. Jeez. Jeez. But it, it's tasty and um, it has a nice look to it. This is a very yeah. peeling potato on the plate right now. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to impress someone making a yeah. potato. Yeah. They're, 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 kind of, they're, they're fancy potatoes. Like, I mean, they're always on menus. As like, I, I laughed because I was looking for a couple places I could get them, uh, you know, just on, on a restaurant menus and they're always I feel like they always accompany the chicken dish that otherwise wouldn't be that fancy but it's like woo but it's okay because mm. there's fingerling potatoes with them not just regular potatoes um but yeah and the, the photo of this will be on our twitter account at the immortals pod also one of them is kind of vaguely penile not like super <laughs> penile but like vaguely just what? saying I don't know it's got like kind of like two like little, if a child were to draw a penis yeah possibly a girl what? child who hadn't seen one yeah <laughs> Okay. Can you put a picture of that up? It's yes. the same picture. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take a picture specifically of the one that I think kind of looks like a penis. Like, it doesn't look a lot like a penis. Just, just a little like, bit. We're going to get so many new Twitter followers. But <laughs> most most of the potatoes do not look like a penis. So That's true. Most of them... They look like fingers? Most of them, like, no... <laughs> like fat, big, fat fingers. Yeah, They're yeah. They're shaped They're, like, large. Yeah. Long. They're, like, oblong. <laughs> like, if you had potato-shaped fingers... It'd look just like it that. It would look just <laughs> like that. Whoa, yeah. man. Yeah. I feel we've strayed and perhaps should hedge these. Yeah, yeah. hurry up and hedge these. I want to. I want to go. I want to go. Oh my gosh. Okay, he's really excited. Uh, uh, let's just draw this out now. I want you to rank no, every no, single no. one. No, <laughs> right, each each <laughs> potato individually. Yeah. I've had a lot of potatoes. Sure. The first one I was worried was going to be you know under or overcooked. So I was very nervous. And I think that got sure. to me. Yeah. Um. So that was lower. But then the better the later ones were higher. Think about it. I'm not sure. I think I'm going to go. Don't rush this. I don't know. With like a... Come on! Four point... Jesus Christ. Three... Seven... Five. They called us a... Apparently you can't do that. Four point three eight. We do two... Look at our Google Doc, which will be online on our website soon once I finish the the website. Yeah. Yeah. So 4.38. 375. 375. I wasn't listening. All right. Whatever that was. Adam, what do you think? 
in the context of potatoes, these are really good. So yeah. I'm gonna give them a, I'm gonna give them a three point seven. Three point seven. Yeah. Do you like potatoes? No, I do like potatoes. That just seemed like your sentence was very much like, kind of potatoes. These are really good. Then like kind of a lower rating. Like, I just feel like a potato is like. Can only be so good. What, what's what's an yeah. average potato for you? Is that started at three. Like a three. Yeah. yeah. I like sweet potatoes more than. These are closer to like russet potatoes. Yeah, they are. Um, but with thinner skins, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So compared to, I'm comparing it to a russet potato. So enough about potatoes, guys. Austin, what do you rate this? Well, I, I, I'm a better rate, but also I have a thought. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Which I forgot that I still had another one of our items still here in the house. Potato can read Meats. that. Meat! No, no, the meat's here. I'm saying meat is good. Would that spice be good on this? Yes. Oh my god, I was so tempted you to put Ponch Ferran. No, we have to toast it, so let me do it after the podcast. But yeah. Ponch Ferran, which we reviewed in episode three or two, I think three. three, something like that, one of the early ones, which is the Indian spice. I actually put on potatoes. These would be a great uh, oh, yeah. base yeah. for that, and I may in fact do that later. All right, I was just yeah. thinking we okay, could do that while. Uh, we're probably going to cut potato segment, so it's going to be so Yeah, I mean, I figured there's... But I mean, I'm going to give... It's, he's not very excited, and, you know... I'm going to give this potato... Jesus. Four hinges. Okay. <laughs> this is a good potato. You all should buy it. It is available in stores. Apparently <laughs> <laughs> not. And if you find somewhere that you actually can uh, get r- general, genuine certified rats of potatoes wrap potatoes. Let me know, because uh, it was relatively difficult to find. My guess is that's just a seasonal thing, and I'm going to be looking again in the summer, and we'll definitely come back to it if I find it out for sure, and we'll do, like, a comparison taste test thing. Old business, new, and just... Yep. You can email us your potato info at theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com, because Pedro uh, side and I'm going to repeat this, theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com, and our Twitter account is twitter.com slash theimmortalspod. Children's, go now? children's book is next. Is that no, right? no, no? Okay, what so uh, <laughs> classical recording for this week is oh, what the is it? Caprices by uh, Niccolo Paganini. Awesome! I love these things. Spoiler alert, or full disclosure, actually, I guess I, I used to play the violin, so this is like that's ooh, like really happy for me. No, the spoiler. Uh, no, not, not spoiler, a spoiler for the future. Full, full you just gave story. backstory. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Paganini was an awesome dude. <laughs> he was uh, a bit of a child prodigy. He picked up... He, he was a guitarist and composer and violinist. Biggest violinist of his time. Like, Superman violinist. Um, everyone loved him. Huge show-off guy. Uh, it even said... And, like, just... I really want to meet him. Wikipedia quoted literally... His fame as a violinist was matched only by his reputation as a gambler and womanizer. Awesome. Can we best friends? Yeah, I know, right? Um, I heard this story uh, in violin circles, not sure how true it is, that he would sabotage his own strings to break during his shows so that he could be like, oh, don't worry, guys, I can still play it I, on three strings. Oh, don't worry, guys, I can still play it on two strings. Oh, no, I only have a G string left, the lowest one. I can finish this, just to show off. That's, that's, that's really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. That's the Jimi <laughs> Hendrix of this time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, definitely. He was, he was the rock god of his time, if there ever was one. Totally awesome dude. Um, the Caprices, they are they're more like Etudes, and because they are really hard... When you listen to them, there is some craziness going on with each and every one, within each and every one of these, with what these guys are doing, with their fingers, with their bows, everything, all over the place. Um, not all, some of them can be kind of boring, only some of them, only some of them, but particular ones that I loved a lot are numbers 1, 4, 9, 10, 20, and 24. Everyone loves 24. 24 is awesome, because Jack Bauer... I mean, uh, <laughs> 24... Caprice number 24 oh, is amazing, because... Well, it's the most famous one. It's the one you hear all the time. I listen to all of them, re-listen to the ones that I liked, and then only listen to the 24th one by many different people. It is when you when you are comfortable with, or when you play an instrument, or 
listen to a certain instrument a lot like I did with the violin. It is These are wonderful pieces to listen to a bunch of different violinists play because they will take all sorts of creative liberties playing them. And you'll hear some crazy shit sometimes. You'll be like, whoa, what? They slowed down here? That is not cool. And it's, oh my god, this was so fun to listen to. This brought me back huge memories. Um, who else listened to this? I did. I did as well. And what did you guys think? Um, it was it was more fun than I was ex- I, I didn't know anything about it before I started listening to it. Um, so I didn't know it was just going to be a violin the whole time. Did you recognize any of them? No. I thought I did, and I, I didn't have enough time to research it. I thought number four, I feel like I definitely heard it in a film before. That was, uh, yeah, number four is a, a very common, like, sad violin piece, like, mm-hmm. to be used in sad settings, and it's a great one. It's one of my favorites. I thought one and four had definitely been in films, but I didn't have time to figure out if they were or not. I'm sure you've heard 24 at some point. Yeah. That's Caprice it. number 24. Yes. <laughs> not just a clicking clock noise. <laughs> but Adam, uh, you're talking. Yeah, um, I feel like I would have enjoyed it more if I knew more about music. It, it felt like a an exercise in um, a composer kind of showing off? Is that wrong? No. That's... that's the Okay, so he dedicated all of them to... Some, well, he dedicated the full 24-piece works just to all, I think. Um, and then each one individually dedicated to people. The last one he dedicated to himself. So oh this God. episode is all about <laughs> narcissism. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> this is... Yeah, it's... The to team myself is- regrettably buried... Love yourself. That's the theme. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so. I, I really liked it. I was very impressed. It was such a complex noise the entire time. Noise is a kind of any word, but mm-hmm. it's not the right word. It, it was such an impressive display of what was happening. And I listened, there was a, a piece on YouTube that was all 24 in one go. Did you and listen to, you listened to Itzhak Perlman, right? Oh, I love Itzek Perlman. I yeah, love yeah. Pedro, yeah. have I yeah. ever told you that I have heard these in concert by Itzek Perlman or Wait, a couple what? of them? Yeah, Are you he, he played a couple of them at the Itzek Perlman no. concert I went to. Sorry. He's, he's probably my favorite. He's amazing! He's so, oh, he's so, so cute. I could go on a whole tangent about this, but I won't. How the hell can he play these things with his giant hands? He has very large this hands. He has enormous hands. He does. Hands. Like, I could see him playing these pieces just as fast on a bass. Yeah, like, no, it's so, true. And, like, violin strings are not big. Like, No, my fingers even... have trouble to, like, get the really close. And I could not I could not have the dexterity to play, like, almost all of these pieces. I don't know how he does. Well, because he's awesome. He might be a god. But Oh, my goodness. His hands you... are huge. I know, yes. right? <laughs> he is... So I'm, I'm ridiculously jealous of you. When did uh, you see him? Uh, he was in Chicago about two years ago. I met him. Really? Yeah, my I had a very uh, nice friend. Uh, uh, very nice friend. Shout out to Grace who got me tickets. It was great. She doesn't I saw him. I saw him. She will now. I saw him as a conductor, but he wasn't. He, I didn't see him play. Regrettably. His hands are huge. Yeah, his hands are enormous. It's a little freaky, yeah. This is the but we the Perlman, Perlman, I think the Perlman recordings are my hands. favorite, just because I like how he plays. Um... He might be my favorite living violinist right now. Which, I mean, it kind of sounds like a cop-out, but it's not. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's like, I mean, you could go for, like, some sort of hipster choice, but, like, why? Yeah. Like, he's yeah. amazing. <laughs> he yeah. was the one I, I listened to, and what was impressive to me, and it wasn't just because they kind of faded out and all, I could tell when a Caprice ended. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had it on while I was working. I was very kind of entranced by it, but I could always tell, like, oh, there's something new happening here. Sure enough, a, a new one had begun. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I'm impressed with the speed. The, the speed of the things that are happening. Especially oh, yeah. what, one and four, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. And I enjoyed the the video you sent, and we'll put it up on our Twitter page as well. The video, yeah, the video that I sent was of, um, crap, what was his name? Alexander, Alexander Markov. He was actually one of the winners or finalists of the Paganini competition. So in Genoa, which is where Paganini's from, they have 
uh, I think it's bi-yearly, every two years, a, an international violin competition called the Paganini Competition. And um, one of the prizes, I think, like, the first prize winner gets to play a show. I don't know if he gets a loan from, of one of Paganini's actual violins or if he gets to play wow. one show. I think he gets to play one show of either a piece of his choice or the 24 Caprices. And I am think if... Okay, this is all speculation now. I have no idea. But I think that was part of him performing all 24 as his victory on Paganini's violin. If it was, that would be really cool. If it wasn't, then he was just performing really well anyway. He was was very around and showy with his stuff. And he definitely, I I could see Paganini looking exactly like him. Yeah. Exactly like him. I'm ignorant. Is this basically Paganini's, like, masterpiece? Is this his opus? Um, I wouldn't say it's his... Mas- depends on what you perceive. Like, depends is this what he's people. best known for? Like, no, he's best known for uh, what? Canon and D. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's what the every wedding or the wedding song. Everyone knows that song. That was him. Here yeah. comes bride. No, no, not that one. Canon and D. That's the wedding song, guys. Come on. No, <laughs> no, that's not the wedding song. If you don't know what Canon and D is, shame on you. Look it up and then apologize next week. Jesus Christ, <laughs> man. Yeah, <laughs> this this Canon and D deserves it, and Paganini deserves it. These twenty four caprices are definitely like big, big names in violin world land, violin land. And classical, cool classical music land in general. You'll eventually come across the caprices. Um, usually played solo violin. Sometimes you'll like people have put um, piano accompaniment type ad- adaptations and stuff, but. Great stuff, great stuff. Watch videos of violinists playing it, because it's one thing to hear all of the technicalities and all of the stuff that's going on, but it's another to actually see them doing it. It's it's so great. So great. Oh. Adam just showed me the sheet music for Canon and D, and shockingly, that didn't help me very much. <laughs> it is by Paganini, right? It's Pacabell. Yeah, Pacabell. Is that Pianini? P- Paganini. Who are we talking about? Paganini? Oh, no, crap, it is Pacabell. Yeah, I was wondering... Pacabell. I was Dang. like, I messed yeah, up. I was like, I'm pretty oh, sure that's Pagabell's game. I'm sorry. I didn't want to, like, call you out. I apologize. I apologize, Paganini, very bad. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh God. Now we've ruined Pedro. Oh, this is bad. This is bad. There are going to be repercussions of this. Oh, no, that's not good. I, I shouldn't have messed up so bad. I feel oh. kind of better though, because I was like, "Wait a second, Paganini no. didn't do Canon and D." That was that was that was a bad thing. I also feel better because I, I I mean I know what piece you're talking about, and I but like I was like, "No, I'm pretty sure that's Pagabell." And then I was like, "Maybe it's like a different name for him," because that wouldn't be that would be ridiculous. But no, it's not. No. Guys, I made a bad thing. You uh, fucked up. Right, I, that, was, that was not good. Oh, uh, should we wrap it? Wrap Pedro, it up. Let's, let's just save this segment by doing some hinges real fast. Oh, oh, okay, fine. Oh, shout out to uh, number 10. I really like number 10 because it sounded like bagpipes. Sure. Okay. Uh, for me, this five. Five? Wow. Yeah, yeah. There's not, there's, yeah, five. Easily. Easy. Five. Uh, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a four because it sounded like a, a master at work, and that's always fun to hear. Um, but I don't, didn't, like, love it. I... Liked it. I thought it was 4.3. I was impressed all the way through it. And certain ones really kind of stood out for me. And I wanted to look at them more. I think that's a, that says something about the music. So 4.3 for me. This is uh, very good. good. And we will supply some YouTube links on our Twitter page. And we look forward to hearing what you think. But now I have no transition towards... It's a really big bear. Oh my the God, biggest it's bear! The biggest bear in the whole world! You might say it's the, the biggest bear. What is this? Um, this is a children's book. It's a meaty little book by Lind Ward, um, published in 1952. It won the Caldecott Medal for illustrations. Um, and special special note for the illustrations, they are fantastic. Yeah, they're um, black and white, but they're really... They're like, black and white, super deep, kind of Norman Rockwellian. A little, yeah, but like country Norman Rockwell instead sure, of like yeah. instead of like city Norman Rockwell. Yeah. <laughs> and this was his first children's book, I think it said it in the oh. description. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 
Uh, Look at Austin actually reading the dust jacket of the book. Yeah. Sure. Do, do you not do that usually? <laughs> I'm just laughing because neither Adam or I did, clearly. <laughs> he, was a, he was a book designer. A boat designer? Book. Book <laughs> designer. Oh, he also that would be more interesting. Carvings. Yeah, he did carvings. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's very beloved, I guess. Um, I beloved him. <laughs> I beloved him so much. <laughs> Uh, so, The Biggest Bear is, um... Biggest Bear? It's about this child named Johnny Orchard who goes out, <laughs> um, into the woods to kill a bear because everyone else in his small little town has a bear skin on, on their doors. So he wants to go out and kill a bear because his grandpa met a bear but ran away. So he wanted to do it and he meets this little bear and, uh, takes him home, doesn't kill him, thankfully. Be quite a dark turn for a children's book. In a shorter book. Shorter, much shorter. The biggest book. bear that yeah. I killed with my bare hands. It was gonna. Uh-huh. It was gonna bear be hands. the biggest bear. Bear. It was hands. little when I killed it, but it was gonna be big. <laughs> um, and then it comes Take back. Voice was in there. And <laughs> uh, so he basically takes it back as a pet, and um, it's. Does bear things when you do when you take it back to live with humans. It eats everything, um, but it's like it's a super nice bear as bears go, and mm-hmm. and eventually, I don't know. Can I? I can just can say yeah, right? This? Yeah, so I feel like I should. Yeah, spoil it, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a picture book. I believe you mentioned this. Yeah, it's a picture book. So it's it's twenty some. No, sorry, fifty some pages. Yeah, it's, it's roughly long. Yeah, but it's like a sentence so per page. Um, and you just gotta look at the illustrations. Um, so eventually everyone else in the town, uh, the bear starts eating their stuff, the farmers, um, Mm -hmm. like their sugar and their corn. And so they're like, something has to be done. So Johnny goes out to take the bear to, um, live back in the wild, but that doesn't work because the bear just keeps coming back. And then Johnny takes a gun takes him out into the woods and then the bear <laughs> <Yeah>. smells <laughs> shoots him dead. No, yeah. no, 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 no. So the bear smells uh, smells something and Lee trails Johnny along through the forest into the woods and they get trapped and then uh, it turns out it was zoo people and they take the bear to the zoo. So this was actually like a really sad book for me. <laughs> This so sad. For most of it. Yeah, okay. 95% of this book was, what is going on? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I just feel like it's it's like humans can't live with bears because we're not supposed to. Yes. <laughs> so stop killing bears and capturing them. And it's, um, it's fascinating. The, all the illustrations have such a, a kindness towards the bear. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not all of them. There's one where some guy is... Like straight up point blank shooting a bear in the face. But that was yeah. that was. It's a different bear. The bear, the biggest bear. But that illustration that you're talking about, that is from the point of view of the hunter. The hunter sees that as a threat. It's true. So whereas all the other bear photos, it's like actually, bear. those bears look startled as we pull up the picture again. It's true. Yeah, the, they're the just kind of like what what. <laughs> Bears are in real life are horrifying creatures. No, no, no. They're wonderful. They're, and they're, they're terrifying. And wonderful. Being around one, I want but one. Not horrifying. If I could I hug bear. any animal without being killed and mauled to death, it would be a grizzly bear. There's a documentary. You should watch it. Yeah, <laughs> they're just so fuzzy. I just want to pet them on their face a lot. So the thing about these illustrations <laughs> is that with the bears, even the ones that do get killed in the very beginning, they all have kind of a human quality to them. Yeah. Their eyes. It's their eyes because bears kind of, you associate bears with just having like a solid black yeah. eye. Um, or pupil anyway. But these bears have like irises and I think that's what makes them human. But the point is they do have a human quality but, you know, it's, it's awesome. kind of, tr- the biggest bear kind of tries to come in to live with these humans but... The humans just can't. I think it, it plays with size really well because you have the, the main character who is a child and he is very, very short compared to all the adults. But then when he meets the bear for the first time, the bear, even when it's standing up, is still a few inches shorter than the child. It's true. It kind of creates an empathy right away of like, 
Oh, this no. is something that this child can take care of. This is a bigger creature than the bear. And then mm-hmm. that bear gets real big. Like, yeah. like, 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 I mean, if you actually look at the size comparison of normal human child with bear, the bear is like yeti sized or bigger. <laughs> like, it's like Definitely. possibly, like, maybe not quite up to Godzilla size, but it is a bear that is larger than any bear that I have ever seen. But that's, yeah, that's the big. brilliance because it, it starts off with that small, but when it became big, when you all read it, were you threatened by it? No, no, it was not my all. friend. Because you yeah. saw it as the very like warm bear. You would just you sit down it. on his bum and look at the kid while the kid's like talking to it. I would only be scared if I had some honey and he wanted my honey. That is the only maple syrup. Well, no, maple maple syrup. syrup. That was his jam. Or maple syrup or sugar. jam. Maple if he sugar. had jam. If I had jam, I'm sure maple he'd sugar. like jam. Lee, you gotta watch Grizzly Man. It's, it's a very good documentary. Yeah, you really should watch bears it. Bears are my friends. I you, like bears, too. We're all going to watch it together. It's, I'm worried about all of you. But <laughs> no, 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 I'm book. staying away. Yeah, I thought this was lovely. I mean, I, I, it's funny. I, of course, for this podcast, I'm reading picture books, and I haven't read picture books in a very long time. And, like, you, you do sort of forget how simple they are. Like, you know, you only have, like, 50 sentences, maybe a little bit more, to tell a whole story. And they're, it's, you know, for children. So it's not like this touches any deep philosophical themes, but it's really, it's a sweet little story. Uh, it, it does give you a greater empathy and appreciation of nature. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that definitely does. I right. don't know about it's, it being sweet, though, because the kid was going to drop the bear in the woods. Like, like he brought him out after no, trying like, a few times, a handful of times of taking him out. He's, he's like, going to okay, shoot the bear there's in the only, face. There's only one situation. <laughs> Fair point. He, he takes the bear out to execute him. But then the bear doesn't him. get shot in the face. Yeah, not no, because the dead. kid gives he... up, because the bear runs off with him still attached. He he was literally putting bullets in his gun when the bear takes off. And then he's captured and put in a very tiny it's little true. cage. The cage is, a, is way too small for that bear. Like, it's really, sad. It's but pretty. the bear looks happy. Like I think that's more a function of the time oh, yeah. than no. of the... I don't, think, really happy. I don't think we're supposed to feel sorry for the bear, even though I do feel sorry for the bear. I feel sorry for him because his best friend was going to kill him. So sorry for I don't the, bear. Think the bear. Like knows that though. Like not yeah, too much uh, of the psychiatry, the psychology of the bear, but I think the bear still thinks little Johnny Orchard is like his BFF. Like I don't think he's seen the dark side of Johnny Orchard. Yeah, but that's that's kind of the problem. I think. I mean, it's not a problem, but yeah, I mean. It is a pr- it's a problem with humans because their solution to the bear is to shoot it. Uh, I mean, it's very of mice and men-ish. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I can't let my friend live. People are going to kill him. Right. This bear is eating all my food, so I have to shoot him. Um, and their solution is, no, no, you, we have to capture him. You can't just... I guess they did try to let him go, and he just kept coming back, but... Yeah, yeah. I just think this is a a really dark take on on human nature, really. Damn. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I like. I'm. I've been reading a lot of children's books, so I have to look into them more than possibly intended. No, but and that's I, how I'm reading it. I mean, <laughs> children's books should be looked into at this level. This are the first stories we're going to hear. This is kind of helps that's create a moral too. compass. And I'm looking at this this last illustration here, where the bear is in a cage, and. Already, my memory was like cheating with what the cage looks like. He does it is a bigger cage than we're implying. There is like we're only seeing a small fraction of it. It does imply that it goes further. Does he going back? Okay, it, it, he has like a foot point. or two of clearance above his head when he's sitting upright. Yeah, and like it implies that it goes further back and further wide. Mm-hmm. And I didn't notice this on a little sign above his head. Um, it says, "What are the name of the circus?" Is this is biggest bear in big letters? This says, "Gift of Mister John Orchard." Like, there's yeah. this implication that there is still a relationship going on. That's, there and was that, not a gift of John Orchard. No, it was a solution to a problem. Yeah. And that problem was John Orchard. From, yeah. But, Actually, I was running towards food. But, but it was a solution where the, the kid keeps coming back. He has a promise at the end of, like, you're now in a sanctuary where you will not be shot. You will not be attacked. I will always be here. The maple syrup. And the people who will be kind to you as opposed to always trying to hunt you. And we can get into zoo psychology if we want to. Because <laughs> zoos are one of the most conflicting things, I think, about modern society. Where yeah. they're amazing educational resources, but also you're taking animals and putting them in captivity. It's pretty 
it, it, it's always difficult about that. And this, I think, has a very positive attitude towards it. It's looking for a nonviolent solution mm-hmm. and doing it through a child's eyes and start with a child that wants to kill the bear only for the sake of pride and legacy. They don't really need the biggest bear skin. They just need it for a very selfish and stupid reason. There's no <laughs> practicality about it. And then it ends with, with kindness and appreciation. Yeah, that's a really good point. If it is, if the town's <laughs> the town solution was to shoot the bear, and and the someone kid went along with it, <laughs> right? Exactly, he was going to do it. And so, if you step in and say, like, no, there's a there's a third option, we could just like keep him away from humans, or it put bars between us. Right. So, are we the ones in the cages? Whoa! Oh my god! Oh, <laughs> you can say that for everything we review today. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense to me. But are we the potatoes? <laughs> are we the potatoes? Are we, we? the potatoes? Am I Paco Bell? <laughs> no. Paganini <laughs> is Paco Bell. Paco Bell is Paco Bell. Taco Bell is Paco Bell? No, Paco Bell is Paco Bell. Paco Bell is not Paco Bell is Taco Bell? Paganini? Yes. No. I'm confused. I'm it's afraid. Very difficult. I think it's a really good book. I think so, too. Um, the illustrations alone, I would give this a four. Every single one is rich and... There's, yeah, there's just so much detail into each one, and it adds to the story. Oh, so. absolutely. Because the I love that they don't have, in this edition of the book, the words aren't under the images. The the prose gets, which typically one or two sentences tops, mm-hmm. is on a very blank white page. It's at the very bottom of the page. And then the other page, which is a tall picture book, is devoted just to a really rich, impressive illustration. So okay. that's my hand rating is four. Oh wow! Four? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go uh, four point five. This is really, really good. Yeah, gave us a lot to talk about. <sighs> that's. Sick. I'm gonna give it a. Uh, I thought this was cute, but I'm gonna give it a, a three point seven. Oh. I mean, like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I it's guy. fine. It's not was... the best book I've ever read. You were yeah, on a emotional reaction during it. Well, that's just because I really like. Bears, but if I gave that, I mean, like, then you could just like literally give me a picture book that was just pictures of bears. I have at least, you know, I can, I can, I can snap myself out of the cuteness sometimes mm-hmm. when it's charging you. Yeah, <laughs> no, not then. Okay. What about you uh, I was really close to Sarah. Actually, three point eight is what I'll say. It was a fun, cute. Well, no, it was a cute, but mostly terrifying story up until the point it wasn't. Um, but it was still at that, after that, it was, it became a good story. Everything behind it transformed into a good story. During it, I was terrified and scared. Very, anyway, uh, 3.8, 3.8 hinges. The book made you terrified and scared during a five minute experience. Well, yeah, yeah it was that's, a roller coaster ride. That's kind of the, the magic of it because as a kid, you're like, oh my God, this is such a great bear. But as an adult, you're like. This is not a good situation for this, yeah. this Johnny Orchard. Which Lee doesn't understand yet. Seriously, there are lots of documentaries about bears. Uh-huh. We should need to watch this. <laughs> but they're so fuzzy! Okay, we, they're not pet in space. So, Lee, what, how, many, how many hinges do you give it? I'll be the bad guy. Uh, 2.5. Whoa. Whoa. I yeah. thought it was incredibly problematic for numerous reasons. So. Well, what, what are they? Well, I want to get your... I, I think the... I, I, like, the whole motivation of the child wanting to go get the bearskin was wrong. I think that his parents should have taught him better. And I think his grandfather tried to, but didn't really get the message across. So I think he should have taught him better. And then the idea of, like, I, I recognize bears are cute and fuzzy. They would eat my face if given the opportunity. So raising a bear is also a bad idea. I think his parents should have stepped in again. So, like, this book is just nothing but poor parenting. <laughs> when they have to get rid of the bear instead of, like, finding finding a refuge or a rescue or something like that. They're just like, no, nah, leave it in the woods. Let's abandon it on an island. Let's shoot it in the face. Let's figure out something else so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. I, I hope I, wow. I'm not trying to contest your, your hand right now, but I'm always curious about, especially YA fiction. Um, all of the picture books typically, when you get into, like, middle school territory... There's so many YA fiction that's devoted to parents are wrong. 
Like, oh, they are. It is it's the, the kid who actually knows better, the kid who has more heart and soul. And it's the kid who's kind of given promise of a better future because the parents have made mistakes. Well, and I, guess, I kind of got that vibe from this book. Of like, See, I didn't. Well, Lee hates children. I also hate children. So of... I think that, no, I think the kid was like very much like, hey, I got to go get me a bear skin to put it on my barn like everybody else. And then I'm going to raise this bear. Like, there was no proper parenting. There was no guidance or leadership from any adult figure in his life. It's all, it's all internalized. I cannot wait for Lee's review of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be I have weird. A about it. Christopher Robin is an anarchist. <laughs> He's insane. He is? <laughs> no, I, I just. We will find out in an inevitable episode. <laughs> but now, let's transition right towards um, delaying killing things to straight up killing yeah. everything. Everyone. This, this is the TV show Zadoichi Monogatari. Mm. This is. A TV show based on a very popular Japanese franchise of Zadoichi, who is the blind samurai. And this is uh, a four season show that from the 70s where the actor Shintaro Katsu reprised his role as Zadoichi. At this point, I think he's made like 10 films, maybe. I, I don't know. A lot. I know he's, it, he's, he's around 8 to 10, and he goes on more beyond this show. I've seen a bunch of films. I don't think I've ever rewatched one because they are so many in number. I have only watched one, the first one, the the Tales of Zadoichi, and I intend to watch more of them. But this was a TV show based on that, and it's a forty-five minute show, and I was only able to watch a, a small handful of episodes, and I I, I have kind of a, a mixed reaction to it. On one hand, Shintaro Katsu is incredible. I mean, this guy obviously knows the character inside and out. He's able to kind of play on the warmness of the character, but also, like, when it gets down to it, he will masterfully slice every bad guy in the room, despite being mm-hmm. a blind character. Oh, and yeah. It, it has that incredible... And I was so impressed by... I, I just kind of... I've not seen a lot of Japanese live-action TV shows, and to go into a walk in the 70s, I was so impressed by the production values. The, yeah, right? The camera work is incredible. It's it's beautiful, and then it's very intimate. It's very complicated with how it frames the frame. And I just was very impressed by that. What I wasn't impressed by was the fact that every story was very was similar, always. Were they all the same? I kind of... Got the hunch that they would all be the same. It, they feel Blind similar. man comes into town. Blind man meets good guys. Good guys are having problems with bad guys. Blind man kills bad guys. Right. Blind man moves on. I didn't see the show, but it sounds like the Incredible Hulk. Well, that's the thing. This is now <laughs> we're episode nine, and this is a, this is a very popular thing for weekly procedural television. This is also the same format as the Lone Ranger. Mm-hmm. So this is now. A third of the shows we've reviewed have this kind of format, and there are ones that do it incredibly well. I think this one kind of falls a little bit under Lone Ranger for me. Well, it's a mixture, because obviously this is, production-wise, leagues ahead of Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. But the difference between this and Lone Ranger to me is that whenever the Lone Ranger walked into a new town, I always felt that the town felt different. Even though it kind of uses the same soundstage, obviously... Within the episodes I saw, it always almost felt like you're now just a block away from the last place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the same kind of people. Maybe it's the he same is. Maybe he's place. just going block to block. Well, well I know that. It ends oh. with dramatic wide shots of him going down a bridge and going off to a new place with dramatic music. But you don't see that he just turns right around and comes back. Yeah, he's <laughs> blind. He's always doing. I think. I think part of that though is um i think the movies are supposed to be watched first like this came in response to the movies i know the shows are mostly self-contained units but i know that some episodes are clearly sequels or occur directly after a movie or from what i've read and apparently he does have consistent enemies at certain points like he's killed so and so's father or so and so's boss or whatever and there are people that are consistently after him and maybe that will play on more as 
the shows go on. And I think I would like that more if I was more of a larger franchise fan of mm-hmm. this. And I'm not at this point. Well, I see one movie and now some of the TV show. I look forward to watching more of the movies. Mm-hmm. But going through 26 plus movies and like 100 episodes of TV, it's a lot. It's there for the fans, but I don't think this TV show serves as a good jumping on point to get you hooked on to the show, to the franchise. Mm. I think it almost feels like bonus for those who like wanted more between movies. Exactly. Mm. That's what I think. That's what I think too. And that's, that's exactly what I got because I'd seen the movies as a kid just sort of popping up on movie channels here and there and I would always if if it was on I would watch it and I loved them and I was so so happy watching those and then when I started watching episode 1 and he came out and it was the same guy doing the same stuff but in color <laughs> I was oh man I was blown away I was so happy I can't I can't even I can't even describe and the movies that. eventually did go to color they Probably did. Yeah. So I jumped in on the franchise as well on the first episode of the TV show. And I think it just, you don't get a lot of exposition with the TV show about who this guy is. It's just, nope. I just knew from like, you know, story conventions. that you he's... a more in episode two. Like just like a tad bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Is that the one with the, he goes to the gambling house with the two, the. It's with the, the kid and the couple in love. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, um, but yeah, I I agree with all that you're saying. It seems like he's just, you know, it's going to be the same same thing every time. And I jumped ahead. Um, I saw the first two episodes, and then I jumped ahead to an episode in season two. And it was still kind of he's he's traveling around, and other people have problems, and they come to him because he's a, a hero, not the hero we need, but the he's daredevil. He's daredevil. Oh no, Daredevil is heavily influenced by this oh, character. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they, they both were created around the same time. And, oh, was they? Oh, sixties. Yeah. Wait, as as the show? Okay, not the story of Satoichi. Satoichi came first. Okay. Um, oh, I like the way you say that, Pedro. Say it well, again. That's, how, that's how it's said. Say, it say, again. say the whole thing. Satoichi. Oh, is that, uh, the hold on. Satoichi Monogatari. Yep. Ooh. Lee with the rebound. My yeah. roommate was a Japanese major, so I watched a lot of uh, anime. You pick up on a couple of things. <laughs> Z- Zatoichi, that's actually kind of interesting. Um, so there's a blind man guild, or was, in that period in Japan. Um, and of the different ranks within the guild, Zato is the lowest one. So what they're basically calling him his... And Ichi is his name. So Zatoichi is... Low ranking blind man named Ichi. <laughs> cool. Because yeah. he comes in as, as an underdog. He's supposed to be um, always a masseuse, is what he's coming there to do. Yep. He's a master. That's kind of what blind people did back then. And what Wikipedia says is that was a common or the most common profession for blind people because lack of sight removed and... issues for gender. I was going to ask that because they, they always assumed that he was a masseur because he was blind. Yeah. Yeah. So that made sense. The one great thing about the show, undeniably, is its episode titles. And just looking at... I mean, I watched an episode called The Flower That Bloomed with the Lullaby. Whoa. Uh, There's other ones I had not seen that are called The Heartless Man Touched by Compassion. The Sumo Wrestler That Found His Home. (laughs) A Rainbow in His Hometown. The Fallen Flower That Bloomed by a Lake. A Lover's Suicide Song. This is just season one. Those are serious. Those are no, there, if, if you keep going, there are some that are just like, what? The, obviously the best one is season two, episode eight, The Beautiful Prostitute in the Rain. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Followed shortly by a rainbow and an unseen teardrop. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive stuff. And I, I started off going like, man, I'm really into this. And then the more I kept watching it, the more I kind of kept losing Oh, great interest. one that I love from season three, The Ooh. Naked Crybaby Assassin. Oh, yes. Awesome! <laughs> That's wonderful. I'd watch that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is, it's a show that kind of kept losing me the more I watched it. So, hint rating, I'm going to give it like 3.4. There will be bigger fans of this show. Yeah. 
I, I only watched one episode, so I can't really give a good rating. Plus, I'm heavily, heavily biased from movies and my childhood and nostalgia goggles. Uh, that being said, it still gets a 4. No, 3.8. I already used 3.8. 3.75. You're allowed to repeat numbers. Yeah, but it didn't feel the same as that. No, but I like this better than that. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is like this is like a 4.2. What am I thinking? No, that's see. Watching I'm, I'm this conflicted. existential <laughs> crisis is a wonderful. This is <laughs> you're hurting me inside. Okay, uh, I'm gonna settle with my gut, which was my first one, which was four. Great, Adam. Um, I'm gonna go. Th- what did you give it? 3.4. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do three three. Just three? Yeah, just a regular three. Um, cause it was it was good. <laughs> this I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it and, was uh, good. It was good. Yeah. There are I should say this, there are a number of these episodes on YouTube and that are fully translated. Uh, please check them out and let us know what you think, especially if you have seen the films, and I believe all of the films are on Hulu because Criterion did a giant, like, 30 film box set of the entire franchise. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so they obviously thought it was worth it. Definitely more than a 3.4. Yeah, Criterion thought <laughs> it should be in their collection. They didn't put the TV show in their collection. Yes, they did. Do they have TV shows in the Criterion collection? Uh,. Technically, yes. There is Fishing with John, which is a six-part uh, mockery of a travel show, and then they have the miniseries made by Robert Altman, Tanner 88. Not that Austin's a film nerd or anything. <laughs> you could pretend <laughs> I had this information in front of me. <laughs> if it makes you feel better to think he had to open a book or turn on his smartphone for that, go ahead and think that. Whatever you want. <laughs> I don't care. Anyway, that wraps up episode 9 we did it, guys. Yay, we did so it. So the next one is 10. We're sure. going to hit double digits. Oh. Woo! We're going to talk about it forever, and Adam's going to go crazy because we're going to be talking next. about yeah. numbers. What numbers is that? Is, is that? Is that? Is is that the intern? <laughs> hey, it's intern guy. Oh. I don't like that laugh. That laugh was scary. Hi there. Hello. I have such wonderful news for everyone today. Oh, no. Oh. Yes. I'm scared, you guys. This is going to change the course of your lives forever, and I'm so excited. Whoa. Okay. So, listen, you're doing it wrong. What? What? These tasks that we've assigned you, you're doing it wrong. I know it's a little clunky, but we gave you the wrong assignment in one case. Which one? Yes. Okay. And it's actually proven very fortuitous because I will say one of my bosses is Paganini. Oh, no. Oh, no! Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> That's right. No, 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 no. Paganini's a uh, god now? Yes. Well, of course he's a god. He's immortal <laughs> through his music. Yes. I don't know if you had seen him when he was alive, but... I, 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 I went by once. Yeah. Do you know when I told you that if you had anyone here alive, like you have someone alive now, he would be inducted into the old gods? It would be Michael Jordan. That's what happened with Paganini. He was the Michael Jordan of his time. Whoa! That was a great setup. Yeah. Was he just really good at basketball? Paganini was really good at violin. He was the violinist of basketball. He was. He was good. He was as good as at violin as. Michael Jordan is at basketball. Well, and baseball. I thought I thought Michael Jordan's baseball career was... Oh! Let's disagree with you there. Okay. I thought I could get you on that one. But! Whoa! Paganini is very upset with you, Pedro, oh, and so oh. is everyone else. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Because you said his name was that... That idiot Pachelbel. Yeah, I'm sorry. You I'm confused so sorry. him. The, I knew it was wrong in my head. It felt wrong saying it, but I couldn't... No. It no. Was, it was wrong. It was oh very wrong. So, oh shit. we are changing your category. No, wait, what? No. That's right. Everything you've done no. up until now is worthless. No, that's no bullshit. I'm not. No, you well, can't do okay. that. Was, you can't was, just change was, this. It was fun to listen to, I guess. But, I guess? From now, you have I to. I guess, but that's all I get. You have to start all no, no. over. 
I, I refuse. That's right. And if I refuse, what, what, no, no, I refuse, flat well, out. Then, well, then you're going to live forever. Gosh, no. Damn, what? Yeah, that's that's not like fair. <laughs> you can't do that. I know it's not fair. That's why I'm so excited about this whole scenario. Why, why are you so happy about this? I thought we were cool. Oh, that's where you're wrong. Oh, so, so the intern shows his true colors now. That's Thanks. right. His true colors are shining his, through. Oh, God damn it. What does he have to do now? So, your new task, Pedro, and everyone else who wants to join him. We're kind of fast and loose with those rules. So, anyone else who wants to join Pedro in his new task, which is... No one join. No one do this. Let's boycott this guy. I don't... But it's What's your it is first? That's your choice to make. It's your choice to make. But your new task is... Thousand... One thousand and one songs... You must listen to, and then you can die. So, a song? One That's all I get. song. A song. Every one week. song. But you have to that's listen it. to it a thousand and one times. I had all these oh, great... Shit. No, I'm just, I'm just... By these masters. No, that's crazy. That's insane. Okay. And now, you, you've demoted me to song. <laughs> Correct. No. No. What? No. Yes. Look what? at this as a demotion. <laughs> but I don't even I don't even have the book. I mean, how is that going to... Damn, damn it. Do you have the book now? A, a book just dropped in front of me. That's some crazy shit that we can do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, these immortals are, like, not messing around. Uh-huh. Okay, okay. So, your next number, for everyone, including you, Pedro, your number should be assigned in your book. I don't... I, I, <laughs> just look it over. Just read the whole thing like, next week. God, your next number is... I hate you. I hate you. I hate you, too. Yeah, I, apparently, apparently so. God. I hate you most of all. You're my least favorite. Your next oh, number. Fuck. Whoa! Go past it. Your next number is 524. Okay, 524. Um, according to this book here, the, the movie. Oh, this is a good one. Clute. Starring Donald Sutherland and Jane Fonda. I have Hearts and Bones by Paul Simon. Ooh. Uh, I have, I have, I have cars. Cars. That's not. That's not even a song. That's a movie. <laughs> it is a song. It's a terrible movie. You'll it's not good. It. It's, yeah, it's, it's know, an I'll interesting probably, song. I'll probably recognize it. it. Sounds familiar. Cars by Gary Newman. Oh, oh man, guys, the food is ostrich. I'm pretty excited. Oh. Are we supposed to eat ostrich? I mean, cool. yeah. Like they're not danger. I've had, in danger I've had it before. Okay. The the TV show is oh British show. Damsel and Pasco. And Adam's children's book is A Hundred Million Francs by Paula, Paul Berna. Oh, Why are you know, still here? Are you still here? I'm just I, don't, gonna, I don't want you here anymore. I'm just going to hang out for a while. No, no. What, you just... Got, God damn, you left. <laughs> oh, man. Intern uh, the pad. What intern, happened? Intern, intern hurt. The intern, the intern hurt Pedro. Yeah. It made him very sad. I was, I was punished. Remember that... that, that Gaff I made earlier of oh, yeah, Paganini and Pacabo. That, that 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 was uh that that that's not that was it was bad. Shit, but wait. apparently they were gonna do this anyway, even before that. Shit, uh, I I got demoted now instead of getting full on operas and symphonies and all that, I get a song. <laughs> cool. Like song. That's 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 what I get. One song. Shit, One wait. song. A week. Shit wit. Down. It was. It was, and apparently he's hated me the whole time. I thought we were friends. I have no idea. I've never met him. He, he loved it. <laughs> he was smiling and crackling. I'm actually glad that we're in different places right now because if I had experienced this with you in front of me, I would probably never like you ever again. Even though it wasn't you, but it was your body. Right. Yeah. That was so. So Bethany did us a solid there, I suppose. We are going to find happen. out about the emotional consequences of all of this in our oh. next episode. Wait. What's 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 Adam Shorman book? He said it. Oh, yeah. never mind. I did? I missed it. Oh, 100 million oh, frames by oh, Paul great. Berna. Thanks. We tell you after the show anyway. Okay, great. Thank so you. please join us Thursday next as we discuss everything we just did. We'll find out how upset Pedro's going to be that he has to listen to a whole three-minute song. And <laughs> we'd love to hear your comments in between. So please, please email us at theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com. Tweet us at theimmortalspod. And most of all, leave us a review on iTunes. That way more people can find our show and listen to our long quest as we go towards death. While reviewing good art along the way. 
So, thank you, everybody. My name is Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. I'm Pedro. We'll catch you all next week. Goodbye, everyone.
I'm surrounded by 